I'm going to do a quick demo. Uh, these are the steps I'm going to go through. They're very simple. The first step is um, you need to create what's called a guest collection. And this is really just a the data access interface that your guests are going to see. As the data owner, you create this guest collection. And that is a one-time, usually a, a one-time um, activity. You create the guest collection once. You don't do that every time you share data. You do it once. It's I think of it as a way of, of basically enabling your data to be shared. And then steps two and three are the steps you do over and over each time you want to share. You select the directory you want to share and you add the user or group that you want to share with. So to log into the Globus web app, you just go to app globus.org and you can log in. I could log in with my University of Chicago credentials, for example. I'm not going to right now because I'm going to take on the persona of a PI, let's say um, Dr. Black Cat, and I'm going to log in with my Globus ID, um, which I already have authenticated with recently, blackcat at globusid.org. And I go to the Globus web app and I see the file manager. And let's say I come to the file manager and I want to share data. There's some data that I have um, sitting at my campus storage and I want to um, enable sharing on that data. So the first thing is I need to find that collection and I just search for it. And I have my campus storage bookmarked so that I can immediately open up my campus storage right here. It opens up and this is my home directory. There's the path um, and my campus storage. It's much neater than my own home directory on my campus storage. But um, so I want to now create a guest collection. Like I said, this is a one-time step. I just want to enable sharing on 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 this directory. So I just hit the share button and I need to add a guest collection. Normally all of my collections would be listed here. I don't have any, so I'm gonna add one. And all I need to do is provide a name and that's all I need to do to create a guest collection. We'll call it black cat um, guest collection for data sharing. And I will create the collection and then I'm done. I don't need to do that again. What I do need to do now is, again, select the directory I want to share and the people I want to share it with. And that is done on this permissions page. So I want to add a permission. So I'm going to hit add permission. And the first thing is I'm going to select the directory. So I will browse my home directory. And let's say I want to share some raw data files, some image files with someone in my lab. Um, so I select that directory and then I select um, who I wanna share it with. Now I can share it with a user. I could share it with a group. If I have, let's say my whole lab, if I wanna share it with my entire lab group, I could share it with all Globus users. I don't wanna do that, um, but there are use cases for doing that or I could share anonymously. Again, there are some use cases for that, but today I just wanna share with someone in my lab, let's say VAS, um, there's Vass in my lab and I'm not going to bother sending him an email to let him know that um, sharing has occurred. He's right next door, I'll tell him. I'm not gonna give him write permission because he doesn't need to write to the raw data. He just needs to pull the images that are in this folder. So I don't need to give him write permission, so I won't. And so I add the permission and it's as simple as that. There's the path, raw data, and it's been shared with Vass. So let's do that again. Um, what if I want to share another directory with someone who isn't part of my institution? Um, it's really the same process. I browse to the directory and go up one folder because this time I want to share results with my collaborator. And I enter their username. Um, I could share with Greg, um, which I did this morning, but I'm not going to bother him with that. another email. I will share with... Um, my collaborator named Dormouse. I'm going to send her an email. Um, I will give her right permission because she's also gonna drop results for me in that folder and I add permissions and there are her permissions on results. So that's all the researcher needs to do. Um, let's look at this now from the perspective of Dormouse from, from let's say the collaborator. So I'm gonna log out. I'm gonna log back 
into the web app at this time as Dormouse, which is a Google identity. So I'll sign in with Google, one of my many Google identities. There we go. Dormouse. And Dormouse received an email saying that I had shared data with her. Um, so she could have just clicked on the link that was in that email, and that would go directly to the collection and open up that collection, and she would see the data, but she's lost the email. So she needs to come to the web app and search for that shared data. And so she just hits search and conveniently she can list all the data that's been shared with her and she sees, there it is, there's Black Cat Guest Collection. And when she opens that up, she sees the results folder and notice that's all that she sees. She doesn't see the fact that this is actually a path in the home directory of Black Cat. It looks just like the top directory to the collaborator and she only sees the results folder. She doesn't see any of the other folders that we know are actually in that home directory. So that is a very simple overview of what sharing would look like to the researcher and the collaborator. Bridget, I'm yes. just curious about the groups option, how that mm -hmm. those are defined, where are they defined? What type of groups yep. are we dealing with? So those are defined here. Those are Globus groups. Um, I have one group. Um, this is, I'm still logged in as Dormouse. Dormouse happens to have a, a group called Mouse Lab. I can create a new group and I can give it a group name. Um, I can uh, give it a description. I can make it viewable only to the members or to everyone in Globus. And this is not view viewable of the membership. This is only viewable, um, just the group itself. I create the group and then I can invite people um, to, to be members of the group and so that I can manage the group. And in this way, um, this is a, a nice way to manage access. So instead of adding people individually, you just add the group as, as allowing access to a folder. And then access management is just a matter of adding and removing people to that group. And these can be uh, non-globus members, like a big external people? You can, so by, you can invite people um, using their email address, mm -hmm. but they do need to log into Globus to join I the group. See. Again, they need to log in. They can use any of those, um, it's getting close to 2000 institutions now um, that, that Globus recognizes or Google, or they can create a Globus ID. I'm gonna talk about, so I've already talked about this ad hoc data sharing and, and a lot of Globus data sharing is ad hoc and this satisfies a lot of use cases. Um, but there are a lot of other things that you can do. There are a lot of other data sharing patterns we've seen um, that are that are used at larger scale. So the first very common um, pattern we've seen, uh, Greg mentioned sequencing centers, and that's actually um, a type of facility that uses Globus data sharing quite a bit. Um, and in particular, to create folders for their customers, and then drop the data products or the, the sequencing runs into those folders and add permissions for their customers um, to those folders. And then an email gets sent to the customer and the customer comes and picks up the data. Or for example, in the Michigan case, if the user is at Michigan, they're not always at Michigan, they can be anywhere, but if they happen to be at Michigan, then the core will actually push the data from the core to the campus storage, to their home directory um, in the campus storage. Um, so that's another way. It, um, you can push data or, or, you can, or someone can come and pull data either way. Um, another common example that we see is um, data distribution again at, a, at an instrument facility, but in this case, it would be more of a, a user facility where users come and operate the instruments themselves and collect data. And in, and in this case, um, we see a need for uh, the facility managers. They create folders and they give permission on those folders to one person, to, to the one researcher that's come to run the instrument. And they also give that person access manager permissions. 
so that that person then can decide how that data is shared and they can share back at their home institution, for example, so that their lab members can have access to the same data they do as it's coming off the instrument and maybe do analysis back home as the experiment is running. Um, another pattern we often see that leverages sharing, you're gonna notice a theme here, is um, data processing or, or data analysis apps usually, um, or services, the compute services. So in this case, there is an application, for example, that where users upload data or contribute data to somewhere um, in storage that the application manages. So the as soon as the user logs in, the application creates a folder for them, puts a permission on that folder, and then the user is able to um, upload data into the folder. The application will then for example, run the bioinformatics pipeline over the data and then moves the results to some folder that has permissions for the user to read the results. Um, and so this is, and this is all automated by the application and the application also controls the permission life cycle. So it will tear down the folders and the permissions when the user is, is finished uh, using the app. And the last example, I hope some of these examples are resonating with some of you, or at least similar to some of the use cases you might have. The last example I have is um, we see data uh, science gateways and data portals leveraging data sharing. So in these gateways or portals usually aggregate data sets from many different sources, um, and then they rely on Globus to um, create search indices that then power a, uh, an interface, a UI that allows the user to search across those data sets, find the data set of interest, and then um, you, the user has permissions through data sharing to transfer that data to their own resources. Um, so that's another example we commonly see. So, all of these examples, except for that first ad hoc data sharing example I showed, uh, they could in theory be done on a one-off manual way, but that would be very impractical. All of them really require some amount of automation. Some of them require quite a bit of automation. The scales are very large. They're very large data sets. There are a lot of users. There are a lot of permissions that need to be managed and it all needs to be done in a very automated fashion. And there are um, several ways to automate data sharing, uh, sort of level, I think of them as different levels to automate in, in, in Globus. Bridget, I've got one question. Um, mm -hmm. Just with that use case with the data portal, am I right then that that almost sort of um, would act as a registry? So if someone discovers a data collection within that portal, it's pointing them to the where um, that data may be sitting, it's not necessarily all housed um, in that it, one it spot. It can, it can. Sometimes the, the, there are pointers to the data that are part, yeah, yeah, the short answer is yes, it can. It could do right. that as well. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about automating data sharing. So uh, you could automate and people certainly do automate um, data sharing by using scripts. So there, Globus has a command line interface where you can manage, create, delete um, permissions. Uh, there's a really nice step-by-step -step video we have that uses the example of a sequencing core that has just got a new sequencing machine and they need to set up a script that pulls data off of the machine into folders to share with users. Um, it's a it's a good video. I will warn you that it's a little bit old and therefore it uses an older version of a Globus endpoint and some of the terminology has evolved. Um, nonetheless, all of the concepts remain and it's a very clear video and I still recommend it even though um, we now use a newer version of Globus Connect server. The next sort of level of automation is to use a flow. Globus has a relatively new service called Globus Flows, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more um, 
little in a little bit more detail. But before I do that, I just want to mention the possibility of automating using applications. So uh, you can use Globus as a platform and create custom applications to automate permission management. And you would do that by creating a client in Globus, or you could think of it as registering your application in Globus. And Globus has client identities that you can create. And those client identities are first class identities in the Globus ecosystem. So whatever a user might be able to do a role, a user might be able to assume a permission, a user might be able to have a client or an application can have the same thing. And as Bass likes to say, apps are people too, um, at least they are uh, to Globus. So uh, using these client identities, your, your application then can leverage um, all of the things that I've just described. You can use your application to create permissions, um, delete permissions, create folders, create guest collections, et cetera. But what I wanna talk about um, in a little bit more detail is Globus flows and how you might automate sharing using, uh, using a flow. Um, so Globus flows, like I said, is, is an, I don't know if we've had a TikTok on flows yet. Maybe we have, if we haven't, I'm sure we will. Um, so then I, I'm just going to say quickly, it's to remind you, it's a managed service um, that orchestrates tasks and these tasks can be across heterogeneous resources. So between authentication domains um, and you write a flow using JSON and a flow is really just a series of actions and it describes the relationship between those actions and it describes the input parameters required for those actions. And that flow then is registered with Globus and then Globus stores the flow and then you can run that flow when needed and, and then Globus will monitor the flow, manage the flow and keep track of the state across all of these actions. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a Globus flow and they can be as simple as a two-step flow where your first step is to transfer some data and the second step is to add a permission. Um, that's a common use case that is used more often. They're a little bit more complicated than that at an instrument facility, for example. You would more likely automate something like transferring from the machine um, than having a compute step in the flow where you might do some pre-processing, then move the data to uh, some repository, set a permission on that data, and then have the user um, come and access, access the data product, for example. And even that four-step flow is somewhat simplified in reality. The flows that we see in production at instrument facilities can become quite complex. These are just two examples and the details aren't that important, but I did want to just point out that, that a flow itself can be a step in, a, in another flow. So you can build some very interesting automation using Globus flows. But today uh, I am just going to run a very simple, demonstrate a two-step flow where you transfer some data and set a permission um, in the time that we have left. So let me just make sure, yeah, that's what I was gonna do next, okay. But you know what, so that I don't go back and forth between web app and slides, I just have two more, a few more slides. I'm just gonna finish those up and then I'll go, I'll finish with the demo. So I said I would um, talk about sharing controls. So in case anyone is, is worrying about letting their users, every user share all data they have access to anyone who can log into Globus. Um, you can actually put very um, careful fine-grained boundaries on sharing if you like if you are a storage admin and you feel that's necessary. So you can define which collections can be shared and which cannot. You can define which paths can be shared and which cannot. So you might not want to have users share scratch, for example. Um, you can define what level sharing. You can say users can only provide read permissions, for example. 
you can define who can share. So you can define which users can share and which groups. And now when I say groups, I don't mean Globus groups. I mean the local, let's say it's a Linux file system, the local Linux or Unix groups. So which local users and local groups can, can share or cannot share. So this is, these are all whitelists or blacklists. Um, and if you really want to get fine grains, you can define who can share what paths. You can also define with whom researchers can share. So if you want to say, yes, my users of this storage system can share, um, they can share any paths, but they can only share with people who have um, identity providers in RNET, for example, that are part of RNET. You can constrain that sharing to particular a particular set of identity providers, if you like. You can always view all of the permissions that are set. Uh, and by you, I mean the, the endpoint admin can view all of the permissions and delete them. Um, and finally, as I said, the last word are the file system permissions. And um, if you change the file permissions, you, system, the local file permissions, you can be sure that that will also impact guest access as well as local user access. Users also have control. I've already talked to them. They decide what path and what level with whom it's shared. Um, and they can also decide who, who can also do some sharing so they can, they can assign this access manager role. Like I said, I don't want to switch back and forth, so I'm just going to end with the two support slides. So I'm, I'll send the slides so you guys have the slides. But these are specific. These are resources specific to sharing. This is a, a how-to guide, just a screen share, screenshots of essentially what I showed you early on the first demo. Um, these are two good videos done by our Greg, um, Secure Sharing for the endpoint administra administrators. And then this is from the view of a collaborator who just got a sharing email. Now, what does he do? Um, and then the Jupyter, a Jupyter notebook for writing a flow. And that's the flow that I'm gonna show you in a minute. And it's for writing this flow, which transfers data and then sets a permission or an ACL. And then here is a GitHub repository full of example. Uh, full, well, it has one, example flow for transfer and sharing, but then it has a lot of other examples for, for different types of, of flows. Um, now let's, I'm gonna log in as Black Cat again. And in this case, Black Cat, let's say, um, frequently gets images from an imaging core, some national imaging core, and is constantly moving data from that imaging core to the lab and then wants to share it with the whole lab. So they have a group, a Globus group. Um, let's take a look. Called the Black Cat Lab and all of the lab members are in this group. So routinely they move data from the imaging core and wanna share it with the lab. And so they've written a flow to do that. To access flows that you've written um, in the web app, you go to the flows area. And the first thing you'll see is all the flows you've already run. So these are just executions of various flows. If you want to start a new flow, you go to the library. This is the library of flows. And in this case here, the top flow is the one I use most often. And it's a transfer and set permissions flow, two, easy two-step flow. And you um, just hit start. And then it will ask you for the input parameters to this flow. And I've written this flow so that the default is always the national imaging core where my images are and always the path that's my account. So I don't need to go search for it every time and pick the folder, I, it's the default. I could have also set the default here um, for the destination, but I didn't. So let's find my, um, oops, let's find my, guest collection, there it is. And let's browse and let's move the data to this, my raw data file folder, sorry. And then I have to share it with someone. And I, again, in this flow, I have set the default. I don't, I could actually write this flow so that it's not even an input parameter, it's just hard coded. It's always shared with this group. But in this case, it's just the default. I can change it if I want, but I won't. It is a group, and this is the ID of that Black Cat Lab group that I that I showed you. And the last step is just to 
label the run, we'll call it the rnet transfer and share demo run, and I will start the run. And this then Globus now will monitor the transfer. When the transfer is finished, it will then automatically set those sharing permissions for the group. So let's see, let's watch the run details. And I am a terrible, oh, it's already done, but I thought I would be hitting refresh. Um, all right, so the flow succeeded and let's let's see um, what that means is the folder should have been moved to that guest collection, my black cat guest collection. So let's see, let's search for the collection. Here it is right here. And in the data, Folder, there it is. So this was the new sample with the images. And now this folder should have permissions um, for anyone in that black cat group. So let's check the permissions here. And sure enough, the data raw folder um, can be accessed by anyone in this black cat lab group. So that's a very quick overview of um, automating data sharing with with flows it's a simple uh it's a simple example but i think i hope you can imagine that that could be one part of a more complex flow that you can you can build um and i think that yep that's the end uh that i've got so thanks for your attention